Hello, my name is Imogen Hurd and I'm going to be speaking to you today about the design and manufacturing project I have been involved with over the past year. I will start with a brief introduction to the Remote Labs project, then go into greater detail about the truss experiment and my involvement in the design and manufacture of this system. Firstly, what is Remote Labs? Remote Labs is an infrastructure designed to increase access to engineering teaching experiments. They allow students to conduct real-world experiments accessed remotely via a browser from any location around the world. The focus of Remote Labs is accessibility. We aim to ensure that Remote Labs projects can be funded entirely through teaching budgets and we endeavour to make as much of our work open source as possible so that others can take inspiration and or designs we've created and implement them for themselves in their own learning establishments. They have advantages for students, ensuring that time spent working on labs is increased significantly. They advantage teaching institutions by increasing visibility of engineering teaching and provide an aesthetic and engaging feature for building entrances. The system is modular, based around shipping container style boxes which make the infrastructure flexible and expandable to fit any space. The truss experiment is a mechanical teaching experiment based around a simple truss structure. It relates force supplied at one end of the truss structure to the measurable strain on each truss member. Force measured by a load cell is applied to the truss structure via an actuator controlled remotely by the student. This force and the resultant strain for up to six truss members are sent to the student via a browser based user interface so they can record the data for later analysis. This report focuses on the electronic design which I was responsible for. Mechanical design of the experiment and the containerized box system was developed by Andrew Brown, with the back-end server infrastructure developed and maintained by Professor Timothy Drysdale, and the UI developed by Timothy Drysdale and David Reed. The engineering problem for this project is primarily focused on the manufacturability of the experiment. During construction, there are a number of wires which need to be carefully attached in the correct places. This ended up being a highly skilled and labor-intensive process for the early prototypes. Additionally, the process needs to be easily repeatable to ensure that the data returned is homogeneous between experiments. The experiment needs to be durable enough to last at least a semester of use with little maintenance, as downtime during critical study periods could affect students' mass coursework. And experiments need to be robust enough to move around and even ship worldwide without incurring damage, which would be costly to diagnose and repair. The hardware needs to be maintainable, with electronics easy to access with minimal tools, and subsystems must be easily swapped out for replacements in the case of breakdowns. The Remote Labs project has long-term commitments to sustainability, accessibility and opportunity baked into its mission statement. For this reason, we prefer open source and low-cost solutions to these problems. For some light background theory, this experiment is centred around the concept of engineering strain the change of dimensions of material in response to stress. It's the ratio of absolute change in length to the original length, and because it's a length divided by a length, it is a dimensionless quality. In structure analysis, the structure is deemed to have failed if structural members undergo plastic deformation, where permanent changes to the material structure occur. For this reason, all analysis in this report assumes that strain remains in the elastic region. Strain measurements can be used to infer the stress, and therefore the forces that are acting on the structure. Stress is related to strain by a material property called Young's modulus, or the modulus of elasticity. This describes how much deformation a material will undergo given a specific applied stress. This stress can also be related to a given force if the dimensions of the structural member are understood. These relationships allow students to calculate forces acting through the truss structure using strain measurements in order to compare their measurements to mechanical theory. Strain sensors consist of a resistive wire attached to a flexible substrate, aligned parallel to the strain being measured. The strain gauge is adhered to the structural member such that it undergoes the same strain as the structural member it is attached to. As the wire undergoes strain, its resistance changes. Positive strain causes the wire to lengthen and increase in resistance. As the volume of the wire stays constant, it means it must also get thinner, i.e. it experiences negative strain in the perpendicular axis, and this also increases its resistance. Therefore, the change in resistance can be calculated using the formula, change in resistance is two times strain. However, as the strain value tends to be very small, in the order of a few hundred micro strain, the strain gauges need to be arranged electrically in a way that maximizes the detectable change. The Wheatstone bridge arrangement shown in this diagram is one way of achieving this. An excitation voltage is applied between two opposite nodes in this four node arrangement, with the differential voltage measured between the other two nodes. 
This forms a pair of voltage dividers that act in opposition to each other when the material is subject to strain. And this is the electronic implementation, the circuit diagram for the strain sensors. Each individual strain gauge is a resistor with a nominal resistance of 100 ohms. While the system is at rest, we can see that the differential voltage between sense plus and sense zip minus should be zero, as both of their voltages above ground will be 2.5 volts. Of course, in the real world, resistor values will not be exact, so there will be some DC offset that must be accounted for in software by tearing the scale to account for the DC offset. But for now, we can assume that the voltage differential is zero and the system is at rest. As the sensor undergoes positive strain, R1 and R3 increase in resistance and R2 and R4 fall in resistance due to the negative perpendicular strain, we can see that sense plus will increase in voltage as the resistance to ground increases and sense minus will decrease in voltage as the resistance to ground decreases. The voltage differential can be calculated using the equa uh, equation shown. As the change of resistance is related to strain, a model is able to be built to estimate the voltage differential given a different percentages of strain. As the material would fail under a 3% strain, this was used as the maximum possible value to base design calculations on. The voltage differential at this amount of strain would be about 300 millivolts. This makes a tidy maximum value to use for the rest of our calculations. The next step in the design process is calculating how the sense voltage differential will be translated into an integer value by a micro microcontroller analog to digital converter, or ADC. Remote labs often select Arduino-based microcontrollers for control sensing and data acquisition tasks due to its open source and accessible development environment. Within the Arduino environment, most ADC readings are returned as a 10-bit integer value. So the equation shown here calculates the value that we returned by the ADC for a given input voltage, in this case 300 millivolts. With no amplification, the signal from the strain sensor would only have a resolution of about 60 individual steps. This data is just not high enough resolution to be valuable, and therefore two options were considered. Firstly, a differential amplifier using op-amps. A potential circuit was simulated using LT-SPICE, however before implementing a prototype, a consumer off-the-shelf or COTS option was identified. The HX711IC is a differential amplifier with a combined voltage regulator for the excitation voltage and an, external <coughs> and an internal ADC for sampling the strain sensor. It has a two-wire digital interface and this simplifies the design of the PCB. Due to its many advantages, it was selected for use in a prototype system. The electronic schematic was produced using KeyCAD software. This is an open source EEE CAD suite for schematic capture and PCB design. Therefore, it meets the requirements for the Remote Lab's mission statements regarding accessibility. This sheet details the major subsystems and the main IOs, or inputs-outputs, to the control system. Starting in the left corner, we have the power input connector, 12 volt DC in, a power distribution subsystem, the microcontroller, or MCU, subsystem, and all the individual strain gauge amplifiers, ADCs. This also shows the 37-pin D subconnector that forms the connection between the control PCB and the experiment itself. This is a rendering of the final PCB design. It was exported from KeyCAD as a step model to aid in the mechanical design of the experiment trays. The fabrication files were sent to JLC PCB for fabrication and population of all SMB components, and this aided in quantity manufacturing and quality control. Through whole parts were populated internally as a cost saving measure. Uh, this shows the experiment tray, which holds all the hardware for two truss experiments. There are two of these trays per container. This layout was optimised for a reduced number of operations to access the electronic equipment. In this case, there are just six individual connections that must be unplugged to remove the hardware for maintenance. Validation tests were performed to ensure the system was returning values within expected ranges. Given the nature of strain gauges, results within a 10% variance from the true value were expected. These tables show the results of the initial validation test. Many of these values fall outside this expected 10% variance, however the results prove the system was returning useful data. Remote Lab's infrastructure allowed every student enrolled on the mechanical engineering course 24-hour access to the truss experiment. This was achieved with just eight individual truss experiments spread across two containers. User experiences was gathered using informal methods and overall the reactions were positive and students said they enjoyed interacting with the truss experiment. The lecturers noted that it was a great opportunity for students to discover the issues encountered in real-world experimentation and data acquisition and their confusion regarding messy data would lead them towards implementing techniques like oversampling, averaging between samples, and statistical analysis in order to expose the underlying mechanical theory. Our discussions led to the conclusion that, 
If the data collected was perfect, then they might as well be running a computer simulation that mirrors theory one-to-one. -one. There would be no point in doing practical experimentation as part of the teaching curriculum. It was clear from discussions with lecturers using this system as part of their teaching that this is a learning tool and not an industrial data collection system or tool for research. Therefore, the precision of the data is not the most important factor in the system's value, as long as it is, as long as it is sufficient to enable students to see mechanical theory in action. The cost for the control PCB came in at about £35 per PCB, not including the labour required to finish them in-house. This makes for an incredibly cost-effective solution. Alternative methods for detecting strains such as National Instruments hardware could run into the thousands of pounds, which would make it far less affordable for teaching budgets and would not meet the Remote Lab's mission statement concerning accessibility, and it would not meet our desire to focus on open source hardware. The system reduced the manufacturing time frame and simplified the production line for quantity manufacturing. Although the system meets our requirements, there are still areas of improvements that can be made. The application of strain sensors to the trust members is still a labour-intensive process and pre-assembled load cells are not suitable for use in this case, as mixed material structural members would make analysis more difficult for students. Identifying the correct connections between the trust and the control PCB is still labour-intensive and requires skills to identify. This can be mitigated with robust procedures and better documentation that would be completed if undertaking quantity manufacture. In conclusion, this system has been in use for an entire teaching year, with eight active trust experiments. Feedback from both students and lecturers has been positive. Additional trust experiments are due to be built if additional demand requires it, including retrofitting an original large-scale trust prototype with a new system to use as a showpiece for engagement activities. This project met its goals of gathering data and reporting strain values for up to six strain gauges and the load cell, controlling the actuator used to apply load to the structure, preventing equipment damage by implementing a limit switch, improved manufacturing and assembly timeframe, decreased skills required to implement quantity manufacturing, improved uniformity of the final product, improved maintainability, and it was implemented in a low cost and using open source hardware. This is a photo of four completed trust experiments online, <clears throat> ready for students to access them via the online portal at practical.io. This report is a retrospective on a project that was completed last year. It's enabled me to go much further into depth on this system that was initially achieved during the design process, which was undertaken with little knowledge of the underlying mechanics theory or operation of strain sensors. It has given me a better understanding of the purpose of experimentation within the teaching environment and a greater understanding of the statistical tools required to make sense of noisy and misleading data. Thank you very much for listening. Please feel free to email me if you have any follow-up questions.